Um, I might hold you guys accountable to memorizing more stuff than I did last time instead of just going over step by step because that kind of gets excessive and a little bit annoying, I think. Um, but I'll do my best. If you have any questions you want me to explain something a little bit further, just let me know. Um, but yeah, so the overview of the exam, Dr. E should have emailed you all. Um, the uh, any questions are in each chapter. Just remember, don't memorize anything for exam two. Uh, we need to chapter 14 because we're going to do that for next exam, exam three. Okay, so let's just go ahead and start with um, memory, uh, the chapter pertaining to memory. So these are the questions I would um, be able to answer on my own and be able to write out and explain what type of memory do we have, where do we store our memory, how do long-term memories and short-term memories differ, how do we obtain those, what's the mechanisms for those. Okay, so let's go ahead and answer some of those questions. So the hippocampus and the cerebrum are major memory centers in the brain. And these are really how we form those memories. This is the starting place for all those. The hippocampus plays a vital role in the short-term memory, and it works with other brain regions to form declarative or like factual memories. Um, those are called explicit memories. Uh, implicit memories are more like motor movement and stuff. I don't think you have to know that, but that's just the way it is. So hippocampus is short-term memory, declarative memory, and facts. The cerebellum is more for functions procedurally so, or muscle movements. So that's how you memorize how to catch a baseball or, or how to do anything like ride a bike. Um, that's where that um, plasticity comes in to mem remember those things. The prefrontal cortex functions for working memory. There's three types of memory. You have short-term, long-term, and working. Uh, the prefrontal cortex, I feel like, is a really good example of understanding how working memory actually works. Because if the prefrontal cortex is involved in our decision making, what makes our personality, that's constantly being fired, right? Throughout our day, we can make decisions based on our personality and we interact based on our personality. And the prefrontal cortex is what's responsible for that. And that's really what working memory is. It's something that you're thinking about at that instant and working to decipher and decide what you need to do, okay? And the amygdala is uh, mainly for fear and uh, just like fear responses for um, those kind of memories. And those are associated with like the limbic system, avoiding certain things that have induced negative responses in the past. Um, yeah. So a lot of these brain memories actually work together to form memories. Um, so going into a little bit more depth onto short term and long term. Short term is fleeting memories, memories of events that continually happen. Um, transient, which is really quick synaptic changes, um, limited to seven or eight pieces of information. There's a study that, I um, uh, can't remember how exactly how it went, but it gave individuals a series of numbers and asked them to memorize it. And seven to eight individual numbers is as far as um, normal people are able to remember a series of numbers. Um, so it's pretty convenient that that's about the same length as a phone number. <laughs> Long-term memory, however, is limitless capacity and involves enlargement of cells at the synapse level. So a lot of protein synthesis is going on in long-term memories, okay? And those are more permanent synaptic connections. And so the transition from short-term memory to long-term memory happens all the time, but there needs to be a lot of factors that affect that transition because it requires so much energy. And those factors are emotional states, rehearsal, association, automatic memory, and just stuff like that. I personally believe that a lot of stuff that you remember elicits an emotional response. And I feel like studying is kind of an emotional response in the fact that it's fear-based. And if I don't remember this, I'm going to do really bad on the test. And so that goes right there. So if you want to make your studying more effective, get emotional about it, I guess. Um, but not too emotional. So how do we store our memories? I would be able to answer these as well. And once again, I'll send these to you guys so that you guys are able to go over these by yourselves. Uh, how do we code memories into our brains? Coding of short-term memory involves long-term potentiation and, and, and MDA, so know the role of an MDA, and the coding of long-term memory. Okay, so let's answer those. So mechanisms of memory, the short-term side. Long-term potentiation is just the increased firing of certain synapses based on what memories we feel like are important. Those memories or that actual mechanism is largely based on NMDA receptors, uh, which are calcium perme permeable. Long-term depression on the other side eliminates unneeded memories um, and decreases the excitatory postsynaptic potentials for memory formation. Um, there's a, uh, I feel like this is really helpful um, to know. If anybody has ever been in Neuro 480, I'm in it right now. There's this test called the water maze where they have a rat um, put in this little dish of water and they put a platform 
um, somewhere in that dish of water and they make it milky so it can't really see the platform very well. And the mouse will like move around until it finds it, right? And depending on how quickly it finds it, whatever the case may be, that determines how much plasticity it has. But when you knock out um, the rats or the mice's ability to form long-term depression and induce that synaptic change, when you take this out, um, after a number of trials, it knows that the um, platform is right here. So when it goes straight toward the platform, because it knows it's over there, but when you take it out, it just sits here and stays here until and it just thinks it's right there. But you've taken it out, so it just keeps trying to find it in this quadrant. Whereas normal mice, whenever you um, take the platform out, when you start it over here, it goes directly to where the platform used to be and it sees it's not there, it may hang out for a little bit, and then it just goes exploring, right? And that's its ability to use LTD. So LTD is um, basically your ability to forget old rules and to start learning new rules, right? So if I change the rules on you, it's your ability to adapt, okay? I feel like that's a little bit helpful if that like, hurts your ability to understand this concept, just forget us at anything. Um, I only offered that because it might help a few of you. Um, okay. So both of these are dependent on NMDA receptors. It just depends on what kind of um, reaction you get out of those NMDA receptors. And we'll go into detail on that in a second. Um, but yeah, long-term potentiation is either increased presynaptic neurotransmitter or the increased postsynaptic receptor number. So you either get a lot of neurotransmitter compared to original or you get a lot of receptor compared to original. Or sometimes you get both. It just depends on how strong the LTP is. I, yeah, I did. Okay, so here is a graphical view of it. I would definitely be able to um, know the chronology, uh, chronology of these um, steps. Just real quick, I know that you guys can go over this yourself, so I'll just do it really fast. So glutamate binds to um, AMPA receptors, okay, and NMDA channels. But these NMDA channels can't activate because magnesium's in the way, okay? But AMPA receptors can, since they're open, and so therefore sodium can flow into the postsynaptic cell and depolarize the postsynaptic cell. Once that depolarization um, is activated, the magnesium that was once lodged in here, this channel opens a little bit and magnesium comes out, allowing calcium to come in. Once calcium enters the cytoplasm through this NMDA receptor, it's then able to activate a lot of different second messenger pathways and send signals and increase synaptic strength. And that can come from a variety of different things. It can come from increasing um, receptor number um, through CREB, which we'll get into later, or it can paracrine release and go to the presynaptic axon and induce more glutamate um, transmission by um, activating snare complexes and releasing more vesicles. Okay, so definitely go over that and memorize that. I'll leave you guys to that unless anyone has any other questions about that. Yeah. Um, do we need to know how AMPA and NMDA receptors interact with each other? Yeah, so the basis, on, I would definitely know that. So the basis on that is AMPA receptors um, kind of activate first in the fact that they're not blocked by magnesium. So AMPA receptors allow sodium to go in, which depolarizes the cell, and then are able to um, disinhibit the NMDA receptors, and those are able to go through. So I would know that dynamic. All right, does that make sense? Okay, cool. Okay, so... I think this is exactly the same thing that I did, but um, one thing different about it is CREB. So that's the process, right? NMDA and AMPA are both excitatory receptors that bind glutamate. Um, but once NMDA receptors are activated, this activates CREB. Okay? And CREB is a mediator of protein synthesis and results in increasing synapse number or increasing synapse strength. And it does that through the second messenger cascade, like I talked about, and activates different protein kinases. So protein kinase 1 in this example um, will increase the number of receptors, and protein kinase 2 in this example will go presynaptically and increase more neurotransmitter release. Okay, so that's, that's how LTP increases synaptic strength, right? Either increases the number of receptors or increases the number of neurotransmitters that get released. Yes? What specifically activates CREB? Oh, okay. So CREB is activated through calcium. Okay, so once AMPA, or I'm sorry, yeah, AMPA, AMPA receptors um, allow sodium to come into the cell, depolarizes, magnesium comes out of NMDA, right? Calcium is able to come in, and 
calcium activates CRIP. Okay. All right. Um, Long-term memory. So, synaptic events in the brain are derived from neurotrop uh, neurotropic factor, brain-derived neurotropic factor BDNF, and CRIB activation increases neural RNA content or increases the number of receptors, right? Um, so that's just another way to put it. I don't know if you need to know brain-derived neurotropic factor, but I would just know that it acts the same way CREB does. Okay, so extracellular proteins are deposited at the synapse, and those help neurotransmission, dendritic spines, change shapes, and usually enlarge, and that's that um, presynaptic terminal and synapse um, increase in um, morphology and increase in large and are able to either excrete more neurotransmitter or increase the number of receptors. Okay. All right. So other important functions of the brain, I'd be able to explain sleep cycles, um, our emotions and how we control them, Broca's area and Wernicke's area. These two on the top right here are a little bit more um, not very, oops. These two on top aren't very specific. I would know these generally. This one on the bottom is kind of specific, so I would um, get into detail of that one a little bit more. Okay, so sleep. There's four stages with two major phases. Um, and the major, uh, the important ones are slow wave sleep, um, and it just adjusts the body without conscious commands. Um, the biggest one is REM sleep, which I'm sure a lot of us have heard of. That's just rapid eye movement sleep. That's what REM stands for. And this is where brain activity inhibits motor neurons to the skeletal muscle, paralyzing them. So if anybody has ever um, experienced sleep paralysis, I never have, I hear it's frightening, but that's basically what's happening. Um, you went into REM, uh, REM sleep and your brain has just inhibited your motor neurons so that you can't move. Um, and this is where a lot of our dreams take place. And everyone's different, you know, you get different cycles and everyone's sleep schedule is different and, uh, based on what you need. And this is actually mediated by certain um, neuron channels being opened uh, and allows different types of firing patterns. You get into that more if you get into Neuro 480, but that's not important right now. Um, circadian rhythm is just controlled by the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Um, he didn't go over that much in, in class, so I don't think there's really much you'd have to know about that. But if you're curious, just get on Google and try to know as much as you want. Okay. So the limbic system is actually pretty important. He does a lot of research in the limbic system, so I would definitely think there would probably be a few questions at least about it. Um, and it plays a role in emotion, and this is going to uh, influence our decisions in the future. And the hypothalamus is the center for this. And so it will increase heart rate or blood pressure or respiration uh, just based on certain events that happen. Um, and it works together with the cerebral cortex to control behavioral patterns, like such as survival and mating. So if you have a certain um, environmental response, the hypothalamus and the cortex will work together to decide what you need to do. Um, it allows us to judge the situation, and um, not just instinctively, but also like a refined response. So obviously, if there's a stimulus that makes you mad, the first thing you want to do is to like eliminate that uh, stimulus. But you're not going to just punch a really big person. So that's where that refined response comes in. That's where your um, your uh, cerebral cortex comes into play, actually evaluating the situation and understanding what is the right response for certain stimuli. Okay, well, this is one of the more important parts. The limbic system has a reward and punishment centers, um, and that has a lot to do with uh, drug reward. And this is based on different neurotransmitter pathways for emotional behavior, and that includes norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin. Um, cocaine is a really big player in the limbic system. Okay, cocaine actually ramps this up and increases our response to crave cocaine even whenever it costs us a lot of really personal relation, like really important personal relationships like our kids or our family members will neglect them just so we can um, get stimulated by cocaine. Um, and Zoloft is a more therapeutic version of this. It just blocks the uptake at a more controlled level so that we feel better and we're able to combat things like anxiety and depression. Um, okay. Yeah, so the reward pathway is just majorly, uh, majorly do dominated by dopamine. That's the major uh, neurotransmitter, so I would definitely know that. Uh, like I said in the last one, anything that's bold, I would, I would memorize. Okay. okay, so this one's a little bit more declarative in its language. It's an inter integration of spoken language whenever we, whenever we uh, see it through writing or hear it through uh, 
and spoken words. Um, we use these two areas, Wernicke's and Broca's, to receive it and then uh, formulate some kind of response. So Wernicke's area is, is the major area we use for reception of, of words whenever they're um, communicated. Um, so receptive aphasia is a damaged, like an event where your Wernicke's area is damaged and therefore you can't understand whenever people communicate with you. Um, they can, um, well, actually, I think I got that mixed up. Okay, never mind. Yeah, they can form phrases and sentences, but they make no sense to us. And then Broca's area is expressive aphasia, where damage to the Broca's area um, affects their speech. Um, and they start stuttering and complete words and sentences, and they can't understand you, right? Um, but they can't express what they're thinking. So. I would know the difference between damage to a Wernicke's area and damage to Broca's area. He'll, he'll probably tell you or ask you if I damage this area of the brain or this area, what would happen? Or give you some kind of case study where damage is to one of those areas and then you'll have to identify what's going on. Okay. Um, I'll just skip that. That's just a little excessive. That's a good question if you want to look at that one on your own. Um, okay. The spinal cord is a part of the CNS, um, and I would know general anatomy of it. What part of the spinal cord corresponds to sensory information? What part corresponds to motor information? And how do you name the tracks? What are the diseases that affect spinal cord and the entire nervous system? Okay, so let's answer those really quick. So this is a cross section of the spinal cord. Um, it's divided up into white matter, gray matter, um, and different roots: the dorsal root, ganglia, and the ventral root. The dorsal root carries sensory information to the brain, to the CNS. That's called afferent sensory information. And the ventral root carries information to the motors or the skeletal muscle or whatever function um, your brain wants to elicit. And that's called efferent. I memorized those because efferent is like effect. Um, and afferent means away. And I just think, I don't know, it just works in my head. I would definitely figure out what works best for you to memorize the difference between afferent and efferent because I've struggled with that before I dedicated time to actually memorizing those. Okay, I would be able to replicate this if I gave you a blank dorsal, um, a, uh, sorry, if I gave you a blank cross section of a spinal cord, I would definitely be able to fill in these in and know exactly where these are and what kind of information they um, transmit. The dorsal root horn is above right here and it sends sensory information to the um, to the brain for integration. The ventral horn is on the bottom right here and it sends somatic or motor information to your muscles or whatever the case may be. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Ascending versus descending. You can probably get into a, like really great detail yeah. with this, but the important thing is to just understand the principle of naming these. And it's really easy, ascending tracks range through the entire CNS, but they send signals from the cord up or ascending through these brain regions. And descending tracks range through the entire CNS just like ascending tracks do, but they send signals away from the brain, so they go down from the brain to the spinal cord and send it through the periphery, right? So that one's pretty easy. Um, so know the difference there, that's not too hard. So to go into the diseases that affect the spinal cord in the CNS, the first one would be um, poliomyelitis, and that's just destruction of the ventral horn motor neurons by poliovirus. And that's been eradicated, or nearly eradicated completely internationally, um, but um, early symptoms are basically, I don't know, symptoms are really dumb because that can pertain to anything, um, so that's not really that important, but just know that polio is a destruction of ventral horn motor neurons and doesn't allow you to move very well. And then myotropic lateral sclerosis, or ALS, is uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, and it's just a neuromuscular condition where the destruction lies in the anterior horn, horn motor neurons and then the fibers of the pyramidal tract. Um, so these anterior horn motor neurons and the fibers of the pyramidal tract are also involved in your breathing. Um, so that's actually a symptom that I would memorize and know. Um, those two are 
efferent motor neurons actually affect whether or not you're able to breathe and the patterns of breathing. Um, so people that really don't last too long with this type of malfunction. And it's, very, it's also genetic, and the problem lies in that your glutamate transporters or your superoxide is messed up. Um, superoxide is involved in glutamate transmission. Um, so yeah, that's also one to remember for diseases. The more diseases you know and the more drugs that you know um, by heart actually makes physiology a lot easier because then you're able to connect a lot of different pathways. Um, so anybody interested in drug mechanics should take it with Dr. Subweeks because it's a really helpful class. Um, okay, so spinal cord trauma or paralysis. This one's not a disease, but more of an injury. Um, like we all know, paralysis is just a loss of motor function. And it can come in two different types, either flaccid or spastic. Flaccid is severe damage to the ventral root or anterior horn cells and results in muscle function to areas of the damage in that spinal cord, just depending on where the damage actually lies. Spastic paralysis, on the other hand, is just over upper motor neurons of the primary motor cortex are damaged. Um, and that's really dependent on where exactly it happens, just like flaccid. But spinal neurons remain intact and muscles are stimulated irregularly. Um, so the difference there being that it's exactly what the name says, right? So your loss of motor control lies voluntarily. You don't have voluntary movement of uh, muscles. Cross-sectioning on the spinal cord at, at any level. So if you have any kind of um, injury to the spinal cord, it will affect anything that's below what um, has happened. Okay, so that, that's what that means. Sensory loss in regions inferior to the cut. Okay. So paraplegia is just transection between T1 and L1, and quadriplegia is just transection in the cervical region. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's the basic set of paralysis. Epilepsy, on the other hand, is more in the brain area, um, and this is more of a genetic disease. And so epilepsy is just loose loss of consciousness, fall stiffly, uncontrollable jerking, characteristics of epileptic seizure. Um, it's not intellectual, so people who have epilepsy are as normal as we are. The problem lies in the fact that they have these seizures, and this results from different firing patterns of neurons that are inappropriate and can um, come in two different, or actually three different varieties. Petite mal seizures, which are also known as absence seizures, where the child will just go blank and sit there and do nothing. But grand mal seizures are a little bit more violent, where they lose consciousness and bones are often broken because they don't have control of their bodies. Um, yeah, so those are the main diseases and injuries um, that are involved in the CNS defunctions there. So just memorize those. And then let's get into sensation really quick one. Um, so be able to answer these. How do we sense our environment? Just generally, which receptors respond to pain, to pressure, to light, to lack of oxygen? There's receptors for each of those, and know which ones are paired to which that'll help you with certain um, physiological concepts. And then two-point perception is also important. He'll definitely ask you about that and give an example in class. And then adaptation of receptors, that is a lot to do with synaptic plasticity. Uh, and then how does our body sense and respond to pain? Okay, so let's answer those now. Receptors in the periphery are just channels most of the time. And uh, they may detect certain stimuli, usually resulting in graded potentials to activate action potentials. And these are all the different types. So I would memorize these and know exactly what they're sens sensitive to or what they respond to. So photoreceptors obviously respond to light, mechanical receptors respond to stretch or mechanical energy, thermoreceptors have heat and cold, osmoreceptors are concentration of solutes and bodily in body fluids, um, chemoreceptors sensitive to like specific chemicals um, that has to do with taste. Um, also know where these come into play with your senses. Um, nociceptors are just pain. Okay. So that's, pre that's pretty easy. Let's get into detail about the two-point discrimination. This is also called acuity. And so when you have a large receptive field, this single axon right here has a bunch of different terminals that have a wide field right here. And it's hard to discriminate whenever you poke at two different areas on this receptive field because it all goes to the same synapse and feels like the same thing because it's activating one, or I'm sorry, it all goes to the same neuron body and it feels like you just got poked once because it's all going to the same neuron. 
But if you have small receptive fields where individual neurons um, innervate very small areas of your skin or your muscles, then you'll have very specific perceived um, perception. And your two points will be perceived as two points. Does anyone not really understand this one? I know that in my neuro class, when I took it, like there, there were some people who struggled with this one. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. So adaptation, um, I like to use the word acclimation. It's a little bit more accurate. But adaptation receptors can adjust to sustained stimuli. So when we don't want to constantly be firing, um, our neurons in response to a noxious stimuli that we've seen over and over and that we don't really care about anymore, that's where adaptation or acclimation comes in. And it's just basically receptor depolarization decreases. Um, and it can happen either really slowly or really rapidly depending on what kind of neurons or what kind of stimulus is being activated. Um, tonic receptors act or adapt slowly or do not adapt at all. And that's unfortunately the case in a lot of our nociceptors or pain pathways. Um, and that's because it's really important to perceive pain, and so it makes sense why those would be tonic. Basic receptors, on the other hand, adapt more rapidly um, and involve the opening of sodium channels to help uh, with that depolarization decrease. Um, so that would be stuff like smell. If you ever walk into a room and it smells really weird, but after a while it, it's fine. That's because smell is less important than pain, right? So tonic receptors um, adaptation would be um, non-existent because it's more important. Piscinian corpuscles are detected in pressure and vibration in the skin, and those adapt pretty rapidly. Um, so that's also good to know. Okay. Okay, like I said, nociceptors are tonic in their response to adaptation. Um, but they <coughs> sorry. But they respond very strongly to certain stimuli that cause damage. Um, and these are done through free nerve endings, or also known as C fibers. Um, a there's certain types. Alpha. A alpha and A, a delta. We'll get into that later, and you'll have to know the difference between those. But pain receptors activate, adapt to stimulus very slowly, like I said, and that's because it's important, and they're modulated by a local chemical substance. P is the neurotransmitter that nociceptors use. Um, if you go back to that summary slide of the different types of receptors, substance P should be on there. Um, but substance P also mediates inflammatory responses. So when you have certain pain stimuli, or injury occurs, substance P will also activate certain cytokine release um, and help with inflammation response. And inflammation also um, increases your pain. So whenever you have like a splinter or something and it gets really inflamed, like very small touch actually um, induces substance P to bind to nociceptors and treat it like a very painful stimuli. So that's why that happens. Um, Reflex response integrated in the spinal cord. Um, he often gives the example if you got decapitated, if you had some kind of um, withdrawal reflex, like putting a hand on a so that that would just automatically go because it's not integrated in the brain, it's integrated in the spinal cord. Right. And the ascending pathway to the cerebral cortex, um, conscious sensation and blood. Not exactly sure what that means, to be honest. Yeah, I don't know. But for the sake of time, we'll just move on. Um, I don't th think that's super important. Um, lateral in inhibition, though, is pretty important. Uh, lateral inhibition is your ability to take a really strong stimuli and to integrate it in something much more specific, and much more localized. And that's often in skin, but it's also in our retina. So when we have um, a certain pinprick on our skin, this area of the effect can go to these neurons, but there's certain inhibition on these neurons that cause them not to fire anymore. And so it's very linear and very specific. And that allows us to um, feel certain things very finely. Um, and here's a graphical explanation of that. So your, um, this A, the neuron labeled A here, should receive some, side of, some sort of excitatory postsynaptic potential. But since these inhibitory neurons right here inhibit this neuron innervated at A, you actually get a decrease where inhibition is causing it not to fire. And the only thing that um, gets the stimulus is neuron B, and it's oftentimes actually amplified. Okay. So that's involved in your proprioception and your skin um, and your retina for visual stimulation. Okay. Receptor adaptation. So acclimation or adaptation, what we just went over, can be 
um, different just depending on what kind of neurons you have um, and what kind of adaptation is there. So phasic receptors uh, rapidly adapt, like I said. Um, and so you have this stimulus right here. It goes for a certain amount of time, and it, uh, the receptor potential lasts a certain amount of time, kind of decreases slowly, but you get uh, the cutoff of action potentials after a very short amount of time. And that's not really the case when we go to tonic receptors. They, act, they acclimate a lot slower or not at all. So you have this response right here where this receptor potential um, elicits an action potential. And these action potentials to continue to fire just as long as they're still stimuli. Right, so that's a little bit more of a graphical interpretation of how tonic and phasic receptors actually acclimate or adapt. Thanks. Okay. Like I said, this would be um, your nociceptors. What receptors are more likely to be tonic nociception? Okay. So this is what I mumbled a second ago. This is your different pain nerve fiber classes. You have um, A beta, A delta, and C fibers. Um, I would know this chart because it's short and it's simple and it helps. Um, a beta are large, A delta are small myelinated, and C are small and unmyelinated. And so that also helps with understanding the speed of conduction. Large axons that are myelinated go the fastest, small axons that are unmyelinated go the slowest. Um, and they have different types of association with what kind of stimuli. So A beta are more, uh, more mechanical, A delta are cold fast mechanical stimuli, and C are slow, um, slow pain. So pain that lasts for a while after you um, get a certain initiation of a stimuli. All right, so let's get into the visual pathway. I was actually gone for this, um, so I'll do my best to make uh, as most sense as I can, but if anybody has any questions about what I'm going over or if I left something out, let me know. Um, okay, so explain the visual pathway from light entering the eye through reception of information in the brain. So that would be more the molecular basis of how visual pathways work. Also explain how the eye will adjust in order to see at different distances. So this one is much more um, broad scale function based, that one's much more molecular. Okay, but they're both very important. So we'll start with the anatomy of the eye. I would know each of these um, terms and know where they are and what their function is. I won't, actually, I don't think I'm going to get into this one very much because I want to get you guys out of here. Um, so definitely go over that and to understand which ones are where and what they do. Okay, this one I'll go over. This is accommodation. And accommodation is basically the, your ability to see things far away or see things close, right? And so there's certain muscles in your eye that control this. And they change the shape of the lens, okay? So the action of the ciliary muscles and suspensory ligaments, um, these are also called zonules, so I'll, I'll draw something here in a second, that makes sense. But these suspensory ligaments change the shape of the lens to allow it to, to um, perceive light and to focus it depending on how far the um, object you're focusing on is from you. Um, yeah. okay. So it occurs by either relaxing these ciliary muscles and, um, or contracting these ciliary muscles, and that will, depend, that will um, induce some sort of response on these ligaments, which will therefore induce some sort of response on the lens. Okay, so let me draw something really quick. Where did I put that? Anyway, here's the lens, kind of in this like oblong circle shape. Here's the iris, and it kind of goes like this, right? And then like that, and then you have these ciliary muscles that lie right here. There they are. They have um, the suspensory ligaments are right here. There's three different classes, the one that originates right here, here, and here. And so these kind of go like this, and then those kind of go like this on the bottom of the lens, and these on the side or the top of the lens. And so when these contract, or the ciliary muscle contracts, these actually tighten and release the tension on these zonules right here and cause them to slack. And when they slack, you get a different type of shape, just depending on um, how far the stimulus is, and therefore, whenever light comes in, it either um, causes it to focus closer to the lens or farther away from the lens. 
right? But what you want is focused right here on the retina. So when you change shape, it changes the distance at which the light focuses. And that's controlled by the ciliary muscles and the suspensory ligaments, okay? A fun little uh, way to remember this is to, um, I don't know, I'll draw this. If you want, you can put your finger in front of your face and focus on this right here. And don't focus on your finger. Your finger will seem blurry or you'll see two fingers. And when you focus on this, you're, you can see that focus, but it's really slow because it's, or actually, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's really slow because your muscle's contracting and it wants to see what's over here. But when you don't focus on this and then focus on your finger, you can see that it's a lot quicker because your muscle is um, contracting, um, or I'm sorry, it's relaxing. And relaxation of muscles is a lot quicker than contraction of muscles. So you can play with that on your own outside of class um, and it'll make sense. And it'll help you understand how quick muscle relaxation is, relaxation is compared to muscle contraction. Um, okay. So there's two different malfunctions of focusing the lens and they come in um, either myopia or hyperopia. And so that's just your inability to focus the light on the retina. So it's your inability to move your ciliary muscles enough or um, correctly to get this focus on the retina right here. And so that either comes in the variety of you can't see things that are too far away or you can't see things that are too close. And they're corrected through a variety of different lenses, either concave or convex. Um, so I would know the difference between myopia and hyperopia, what actually is going on whenever we have myopia or hyperopia, and how we correct those. In my physiology class, they had a few questions based on those. So memorize those. It's all right there. Um, so that shouldn't be too hard. So that's my advice for that one. Okay, so perception of vision. This is the molecular side of the visual pathway. This is done through photoreceptors. These are very uh, special types of neuroreceptors. Um, yeah, okay. So I would know a little bit about the anatomy. Ganglion cells are innervated by bipolar cells and their axons join to form the optic nerve. Um, right there, and this optic nerve goes through um, and exits the eye at the optic disc and then goes to your occipital lobe in the back of your head. Um, okay. Rods and cones, there's two different types of photoreceptors that we have. Rods are responsible for black and white vision, and cones are responsible for color vision. If anybody's ever been in the dark and tried to focus on something, have, like, it's, have you noticed that it's easier to focus on it when you don't look directly at it? That's because a lot of your rods are um, around the corners of the back of your eye, and a lot of the cones are focused around the center of your eye. And so whenever you um, look at it um, through your peripheral, it's a lot specific or more clear because these are associated with black and white vision. So whenever you don't have light, it's a lot easier to look at something and focus on it whenever you use your periphery. So I thought that was pretty cool. Okay. So this is the basics of phototransduction. Basically what happens is rhodopsin is the main um, chemical that's going uh, to help you with this. And it goes from cis to trans depending on if you have light or not. And that transition from cis to trans will activate this pathway and then allow you to see stuff. Okay. So where that rhodopsin gets activated, um, goes from cis to trans, and then you have transducin. Um, and this G-protein coupled receptor activate phosphodiesterase, um, and you have cyclic GMP, it's broken down for activation of that, and then you have perception of light. Okay, so definitely know um, the process of light gets um, timed on these photoreceptors, uh, and you have opsin goes from cis to trans, and then you have G-protein coupled receptor activation, right? Okay. Yes. Do we need to know like every specific of the image, like the phosphodiesterase? Yeah, so there's there's a couple more images that are a little bit better than this one on Google, and you can definitely look up a video to um, understand this a little bit better. But yeah, the basic is it goes from cis to trans, that like chemical right there um, changes, and that change activates this G protein coupled response, and then you get the reception of light. So I think it would be super helpful and worth the five minute YouTube video to understand this. Um, they'll do a much better job than I will. Uh, but yeah, I would definitely know that one. 
Good question. Okay, so going into hearing and taste. So um, explain the functional and anatomical parts of the ear. Explain how we send sensory information from our ear to our brain. And then explain what occurs in hearing loss. Explain how we taste, how the taste sense works. Okay, those are the major questions. So let's go ahead and try to answer those. This is the basic anatomy of the ear. I would know as much as this as you um, can because uh, the more anatomy you know, the easier physiology gets. So the main players here are the ear ossicles right here, um, the cochlea, and these semicircular canals, as well as the tympanic membrane right here. So this is where the, ma like the magic happens, so to speak. Okay. So the inner ear amplifies sound. It goes through um, on the, it, well, actually, this acts as sort of like a satellite dish. It's, Sound funnels through into the tympanic membrane that shakes the ear ossicles. That the canoreception um, goes to through the cochlea, and that's where our hair cells are. So the movement of sound waves produces um, this mechanoreceptions. So we'll go in that uh, in a little bit more detail right here. So number one starts right here in the ear canal. Sound waves strike the tympanic membrane, start sending vibration to the malleus, incus, and stapes, which are the ossicles. Um, that sound transmission then goes to the oval window where the stapes right there um, hits it. And then that vibration then goes through um, the oval window. Vibrations um, create fluid waves within the cochlea. And then the fluid waves push on the flexible membrane of the cochlear duct. And then the hair cells that are inside this cochlea begin to move and open and a kind of cilium bends. And therefore we're able to um, that right there, that reception is a mechanical reception. And so those neurotransmitters are then able to activate, release their signals, and then go afferently to the brain where we're able to um, understand sound. So know this one, know how that falls chronologically, and that'll be very helpful. Whoops. Um, so this is just another way to look at it. Here is a blown up image of what exactly is going on in the cochlea. Um, the stereocilia, these are like the hair cells. Um, and they just basically bend and that's where you get the afferent signals to the CNS. Okay. This is also important in our ability to sense whether we're upright or not. Um, in our semicircular canals, we have these things called otoliths. Otolith, otolith means rock. And it's basically just this big patch of crystals or rocks that are on this moving bed of um, membrane. And once we have sound come in and disturb these otoliths and move this membrane, these nerve or these cilium right here, these hair cells are then bent and activate these nerve fibers and they're able to send their neurotransmitters. So it's very similar to how we hear things as how we understand if we're upright or not. Um, so when you bend your head, it moves. Um, those otoliths as well, just like that. Yes. Are the otoliths like attached in any way, or are they just like these pebbles in our ear? That's that's a good question. I feel like they would be attached in some way, but I also feel like it would be pretty tight in there, so it wouldn't really have to be. Um, that's a good question. I'm not really too sure, basic uh, on the anatomy of that. Cool. Thank you. Okay. So gustation is taste. Um, and it's very closely linked to olfaction, so if anyone has um, problems with smelling, you will also have problems with tasting. Um, I knew a guy I worked with at the bowling alley that told me that he can't smell anything and he can't taste anything. Um, and that sounds terrible. But taste is combined in five basic senses. I'm sure we've all heard of this before. It's sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami. Um, I won't get into that because it really doesn't matter too much. But these are all sensitive to chemical signals. And basically all these are just a combination of different chemicals. And we are able to discern these five senses based on what kind of chemicals we um, have on our tongues or on our taste receptors. Um, taste transduction is done through um, gustusin and these pathways of innervation, where, information, where is information sent from the tongue for conscious perception of taste. Um, that's the thalamus and the cortex. So I would know that one. Where does um, gustation or taste um, go to, to the brain for us to know exactly what's going on when we taste something, the thalamus and the cortex. Okay. 
Um, because taste is also involved in emotional state and behavioral processing of satisfaction, um, what other region of the brain would taste receptors innervate? That is the limbic system. So a lot of times when people have eating disorders, um, or you just get addicted to like chocolate cake or something, that's because your limbic system um, has been ramped up too much uh, on that stimuli. And so we crave those things and we consider those things to be important above all other things. Um, so it's funny that food can also act like abusive drugs in a more mild sense. Okay, so this is more of the molecular approach to how taste works. Your tongue is covered in these taste buds um, located on the dorsal surface of the tongue. And it has a combination of these different types of receptors, um, each one um, coding for a different type of taste. So you have sweet, umami, bitter, and sour, and salt. Um, depending on how often these are activated, it gives you a taste of what you're actually eating. Uh, and they all behave in pretty much the same way. Um, they just release serotonin onto these um, primary sensory afferent neurons that go to the brain, um, and then we're able to perceive how we taste certain things. Okay. All right, so the autonomic nervous system. The major questions for this one are the two divisions of the autonomic nervous system and their functions, so that would be um, parasympathetic and sympathetic, so then know the anatomical differences between those two. Um, the differences between what kind of nerves there are and what kind of neurotransmitters there are. And explain the different organ innervations of the autonomic nervous system and how that actually works together. Okay? So, a uh, brief overview. It has two divisions, as most of us know. That's sympathetic and parasympathetic. And these are efferent innervations from the CNS that go to our organs um, and go to our motor um, neurons if it's somatic, but this is autonomic. So we're basically just focusing on sympathetic and parasympathetic. Um, so the ANS, or the uh, autonomic nervous system, is not under voluntary control like the somatic uh, nervous system is, and it has these two categories like I explained. All right. Okay. So this is a pretty good summary image um, of how it actually works and some of the differences. So in the sympathetic system, our spinal cord, the, um, does that not work anymore? So in the sympathetic, all of our presynaptic or our um, presynaptic neurons or preganglionic neurons are really close to their uh, ganglion and they're very central on the spinal cord. So that's two differences right there because the parasympathetic are um, anterior and posterior on the spinal cord. And so the, um, uh, another difference would be the fact that the preganglionic cells are really long. And the way I remember this is we want our sympathetic system to be really fast because it's fight or flight, right? And so if our ganglion are really close to our spinal cord, we can send that information to the ganglion really quickly. Versus our parasympathetic, where we want to be much more slowly, we can send information from this uh, spinal cord to our ganglion, and it doesn't have to be really quick so that preganglionic cell can be really long. It doesn't really matter too much. Okay. And you can see that the sympathetic and parasympathetic work together in the fact that they innervate the same organs, but they work differently. Okay, so sympathetic is often described as the response to ramp up certain um, activations, and the parasympathetic is the uh, activation of reducing that response in certain organs, depending on what the stimuli may be. Okay, Oops. I should have, that was a long time ago. But yeah, that's just basically a summary slide. Okay, so this is uh, zooming in to those uh, fibers um, and separating those two, and these are the other differences of the sympathetic and parasympathetic pathways. Um, so once again, the biggest thing is know the differences. Okay, sympathetic pathways use two neurotransmitters, acetylcholine and norepinephrine, whereas parasympathetic pathways only use acetylcholine, so that's a little bit easy to remember, right? Uh, I remember that in the fact that sympathetic is um, our fight or flight response, so we want norepinephrine because epinephrine is adrenaline, and adrenaline nurse is um, oftentimes thought to be um, something that gets us going and ramps up that response. So, um, other than the fact that these preganglionic neurons are different lengths, I don't like this image very well because it doesn't illustrate that. Um, what we're focusing on here is the receptor types of each one of these and the neurotransmitter types of each one of these. So they both use acetylcholine and they both use it 
on the preganglionic neuron. Okay? And so therefore, the receptor is a, uh, the nicotinic receptor. Acetylcholine always goes with nicotinic receptors. So, so far, there's no differences on the neurotransmitter and receptor level. But once you get to the uh, postganglionic neuron, the differences on the neurotransmitter and the receptors become apparent. So, like I said, sympathetic doesn't use acetylcholine anymore. It uses norepinephrine on the postganglionic neuron. And therefore, the receptor also has to change, and it becomes the adrenergic receptors. And these are classified into alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, beta-2. We'll get into that a little bit later. Um, so that's the difference between sympathetic and parasympathetic. But parasympathetic uses acetylcholine uh, once again uh, right here. And so the exception to the rule that acetylcholine goes with nicotinic receptors always is the fact that sometimes it goes with muscarinic receptors. Um, these are cholinergic receptors, right? Nicotinic and muscarinic because they bind to acetylcholine. Okay. So memorize that image and no differences between um, the anatomy of the links of these Right, which is on this slide, and then the differences on the receptor types and the neurotransmitter types at each point. Okay, I won't go into this one very much because you can do that yourself, um, and I want to hurry up a little bit. But basically, this is just um, the pathway of norepinephrine at the release of these varicosities or these sympathetic neuroeffector junctions, um, and once again, calcium is a major player. If I, would, if I memorized anything, I would memorize the fact that calcium uh, binds to ve these vesicles and releases neurotransmitter. Um, okay. So go over that on your own, memorize the chronolog chronology of that, and that'll help you tremendously. Any questions so far? Okay. All right, so like I said, cholinergic receptors have two types, nicotinic and muscarinic. Um, and just basically know where exactly those are. They're located at the first, um, nicotinics located at the first synapse, and they're on the pathways of all autonomic ganglia. And then muscarinic are only located on the second synapse and only for the parasympathetic uh, postganglionic nerve fibers. Okay. So, like I said, I told you we'd go over the adrenergic receptors really quick. These bind to norepinephrine and are only. Um, seen in the uh, sympathetic pathway. Um, so alpha-1 is usually excitatory in the effector. Alpha-2 is usually inhibitory. So there's a difference right there that I would know. Beta-1 is mainly found in the heart and it's excitatory. Beta-2 is generally inhibitory and it's in the lungs. The way I memorize beta is you have one heart and two lungs. So beta-1 is on the heart, beta-2 is on the lungs. Okay, and the way I memorize excitatory versus inhibitory is alpha adrenergic receptors and beta adrenergic receptors are the same. And the fact that the one is always excitatory and the two is always inhibitory for both ones, beta one excitatory, beta two inhibitory. Okay, I also encourage you to come up with your own way to memorize that because that may not be super effective for you. Um, I would know this table and the fact that know where these receptor types are located. Um, the main ones that are important aren't really on the top and bottom, they're more in the middle. So the heart is important, I would know that one. The, air, uh, the arteries and the veins, I would know what um, receptor types you have there, and the lungs, as well as the digestive tract. So I, I personally would ignore these, because it doesn't matter too much. Physiology is mainly based on these. Um, this is also helpful um, if you're struggling with cholinergic and adrenergic um, differences there. So if you want to, you can go over this um, slide. And it's also helpful to know what kind of drugs block these. He went over this a little bit in class, so I wouldn't be surprised if he asked a question about beta blockers or atropine. Um, so I would know um, where exactly those go and how they block cholinergic and adrenergic receptors. Okay, chapter 12, what time is it? Okay, I'll go a little bit quicker. Explain the three differences, or the three different types of muscles, sorry, and what makes them distinct, okay? So the three different types are skeletal, cardiac, and smooth. Um, 
skeletal muscle striated and it's voluntary controlled, so it's innervated by the somatic nervous system, right? Whereas the cardiac and smooth muscles are innervated by the autonomic nervous system. Cardiac muscles are striated like skeletal muscle, but they're involuntary. They're involuntary because they're innervated by autonomic, okay? Smooth muscle is not striated, however, and is involuntary also, okay? Um, I don't think this is super important um, for you to understand, but if it helps you, then by all means, I would memorize it if you think it's going to help you. I actually, looking at it, I think it does look pretty useful. Um, if I was able to recall all this, I feel like I would do really well on the test where it comes to muscles in Chapter 12. Um, so that may be a goal of yours to memorize this table and to understand it pretty well. Okay. Skeletal muscle, um, explain the following. Uh, know the anatomy of the sarcomere for sure. What areas are shortening, which ones stay the same. I wouldn't really memorize like H-band, I-band, Z-disc, all that stuff unless it helps. Um, why, T why are T-tubules important? Um, explain excitation, contraction, coupling pathway for skeletal muscles and discuss um, what occurs starting from the presynaptic neuron to uh, the motor end plate and actual relaxation of the muscle. Um, and then what allows the muscle to spread the depolarizing event throughout the entire muscle fiber? That would be the T-tubules and the, sarcoma, and the sarcoplasm and reticulum. Um, how your muscles work to produce greater force? Um, and what are the two different types of skeletal muscle fibers? So let's get into the anatomy of the sarcomere. Um, right here you have um, the actin and myosin bands. And the sarcomere is just basically um, the anatomy to contract um, the actin over the myosin right here and to make those shorter, okay? You can definitely memorize those if you want to. If you're um, pre-med, I would, because that's gonna be seen a lot for sure. Um, but yeah, that's the basic anatomy. It helps to um, see it a little bit, um, these little discs and the separations to understand that these come closer together to form um, a tighter muscle and contraction. Okay, so a motor unit is a single axon and all the skeletal muscles it innervates. Okay, so single mo motor units are single axons that innervate a bunch of different skeletal muscles and allow us um, very quick and very uniform contraction. Uh, the neuromuscular ejection is that axon innervating it on to all these muscle cells, okay? And then acetylcholine is the, is the uh, neurotransmitter that activates these motor units, okay? And then the axon terminates at the terminal button and just across from the motor end plate on the muscle cell. So that's the main anatomy of the neuromuscular junction. Um, I feel like it would be helpful to memorize that too. Um, this is what happens at the neuromuscular junction for contraction of skeletal muscle. So um, if it helps you, I would look at this and find an image of the neuromuscular junction and go through these and understand these and be able to replicate it on your own. Okay, so the main points are in bold, bold-dedicated calcium channels open after the action potential calciums Calcium um, diffuses into the terminal button, um, and then acetylcholine is released by exotitosis of the vesicles. Um, that acetylcholine diffuses through the space, and now we're getting into the postsynaptic terminal or um, the effector muscle, and that acetylcholine binds to those receptors on the motor end plate and causes channels uh, to open for sodium to come in. Once the sodium comes in, it um, induces a graded potential that's big enough to open voltage-gated sodium channels in the motor. And the action potential is able to happen. So it's very similar to how neurons work in, theirs, in those action potentials with only slight differences on the neurotransmitter and calcium. Okay. This one's also really big to understand. Um, tropomyosin, troponin, and their um, play, how they play together. So tropomyosin covers the actin binding site, so myosin can't uh, bind to it, whereas troponin holds all three of these in place. Um, and troponin's activation uh, when calcium binds to it actually releases tropomyosin and allows then actin to bind to tropomyosin in the presence of calcium channels. And then they're able to contract. 
So know the interplay between tropomyosin and troponin and how calcium affects that. And here is a um, brief diagram. He's went over this a bunch of times. Um, so try to go over this in your, in your head and to write it down, um, be able to replicate it and know exactly what's happening at each different stage um, and how this um, affects the anatomy of the sarcomere, how it affects contraction. It um, um, allows that contraction to happen once um, ADP is correlated and then you get ATP to release it and that causes relaxation. So all of this right here is exactly how you go from stimulation and <laughs> CNS from to effector cells, um, causes calcium to release this and then you get the contraction with this mechanism. So connect these three, right? That'll help you a ton when it comes to muscle contraction part of the chest. Um, this is um, another image, which I'll go over two quick things. Um, that would be DHP, which is, I'm not going to pronounce that, just L-type calcium channels, and then reanidine um, receptor channels, basically. Will that not work? Um, that's fine. Basically, what happens is whenever you get this action potential, it depolarizes the T-tubule, which activates the DHP channel, um, and then subsequently activates the reanidine channel to open and the calcium comes out into um, this area of the sarcomere and allows it to bind to troponin and release tropomyosin and then uh, actin is able to bind to myosin. So that's a small detail that you also have to throw in there. Okay. And that's just basically exactly what I said. Um, okay, so this is another part of that same process. In order for the muscle to actually relax, we need to um, get rid of the calcium in that cleft right there and pump it back into um, it, its storage area. And so you do that through ATP, um, calcium ATPase, which basically just bumps it back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. All right, and that's how you actually relax um, the muscle. So if you have a problem in your calcium ATPase, you're probably going to get inappropriate contractions. That might be a question on the test um, for muscle contractions. Muscle twitch. This actually goes back to what I said about your eyes. It's a lot easier to relax your muscles, or I'm sorry, it's a lot e uh, quicker to contract your muscles than it is to relax them. Um, so that's illustrated right there in that graph. And then that latent period is, active, is um, controlled by enzymes um, controlling different calcium levels. Um, yeah, okay. Really not much to that one, but just um, a visual image of what happens for contraction and relaxation and which one's quicker and why that's, why that's the case. Um, okay, so you have different types of twitch muscles, uh, fast and twitch, or I'm sorry, fast and slow twitch muscle fibers. And like Dr. Edwards said, you're um, born with these at birth. You can refine these and strengthen these, but you can't really switch them over. Um, so slow twitch muscle fibers rely on oxidative phosphorylation. Glycolytic fibers um, um, develop tension faster and split ATP more rapidly. It pumps uh, calcium into the sarcoplasmic reticulum more rapidly. So everything about muscle contraction, everything in that pathway is a lot quicker in these fibers these glycolytic fibers. And they come in fast twitch glycolytic fibers and fast twitch oxidative glycolytic fibers, where they just basically rely on two different types. Um, fast twitch glycolytic fibers rely on anaerobic glycolysis, while fast twitch oxidative glycolytic fibers rely on oxidative and glycolytic metabolism, hence the name. So it's a little bit easier to remember. So I would definitely know the differences between those two, um, these two and the subcategory there. Um, Contraction force is the recruitment of additional motor units by um, nervous system, or I'm sorry, nervous system increases contraction force. So when something's really heavy and you feel like you uh, can't lift it, so you recruit more muscle fibers to help you lift that um, weight. So if I'm holding um, a brick and then someone sets another brick on top of it, I'll recruit more muscle fibers so I can actually hold it up. But if they dump a bunch of bricks on it and I can't hold it up and I don't feel like tearing any of my tendons and my muscle fibers, then I will um, 
use something else that we'll get into later to help avoid fatigue, or I'm, I'm sorry, to help avoid um, damage. But this asynchronous recruitment, so only picking, only using certain uh, muscle fibers to lift up something, um, and not actually using your whole muscle to lift up something, helps you avoid fatigue, helps you um, induce an appropriate response to lift something up. Um, and that's just recruitment of different, uh, different number of motor units. Um, and it helps you re uh, perform delicate movements like in your eyes or in your fingers. You have few muscle fibers per motor unit, and so you can have a lot more control and a lot finer movements. But muscles for performing um, coarse movements or controlled movements like running, um, your arms and legs will have many fibers per motor unit because that's where a lot of activity takes place. Um, okay. So depending on the number of action potentials and what comes to the motor end plate and the frequency of those will, depend, will dictate, I'm sorry, the tension on those muscles. So summation of these um, stimuli, of these action potentials will increase muscle contraction. Um, and it can get to the point where tetanus is induced. And that's where a muscle fiber is stimulated so rapidly that it can't relax in between these stimuli and it goes into a smooth, sustained, maximal contraction. Um, did anybody ever grow up knowing, like, if you get cut on a barbed wire fence that you might get tetanus? Is that a thing? Because I'm from Kentucky. I don't know if that was the only Kentucky thing. It's actually not the case. So the bacterium that causes tetanus is actually just in dirt, like, all over the place. And so it can get on barbed wire fences, but it's not rust that gives you tetanus. It's actually the bacteria in dirt. So I just thought that was pretty interesting. Okay. Um, okay. Smooth muscle. Well, actually, when you get cut, it, it's able to get in there easier. So that's how it actually works. Anyway, um, sorry, I'll quit wasting time. Explain the activation pathway of smooth muscle. What makes the difference between skeletal and cardiac muscle, what controls smooth muscle contraction? Um, okay. So the difference between skeletal and smooth muscle is the fact that it lacks troponin. Um, the SR varies and is less organized, and you have myosin like chain kinase. There's also no T-tubules, but you do have caviole. Um, that sounds like some kind of pasta. But it's basically just this invagination of a smaller plasma membrane, and there's also less myosin. And so definitely know the differences there and how skeletal muscle differs between um, smooth muscle. Okay. Um, there's a cr uh, chronology of how that actually works with um, myosin light chain kinase. So when calcium enters the cell, um, the sarcoplasmic reticulum actually gets um, stimulated to release more calcium, then binds to the calmodulin, which activates my um, myosin light chain kinase, which is then able to um, just continuing, which is then able to uh, phosphorylate uh, myosin and form that um, active in myosin cross bridge. Okay. So that's the difference there. There's no troponin, there's no calcium that binds to troponin and releases tropomyosin. It's all based on myosin light chain kinase. Okay. Um, we all went over reanidine. That's also a difference between the sarcoplasmic reticulum and skeletal and smooth muscle. But you also have IP3 receptor channels, um, and these store up operated. Uh, these are store operated calcium channels um, that will help you with calcium release. Um, if anybody remembers the HIP2 pathway from the first exam, the HIP2 cleaves. Um, actually, I'm sorry. The PLC pathway cleaves HIP2 into DAG and IP3, and that's where you get calcium release. So it's coming first full circle now. So this is, so it, with that, you might ask, well, how do you actually control your smooth muscle? How does that actually work? When does smooth muscle contract? What's appropriate for contraction? What kind of stimulus induces that appropriate contraction? And that's basically just um, dependent on membrane receptors, membrane channels, and the amount of calcium that you have. And a lot of times, these membrane receptors are stretch-activated channels, which will um, induce calcium release and start that pathway, and you'll get that effect of the myosin light chain kinase activating and, and forming that um, active myosin cross bridge. Okay. Um, yeah. 
that's basically all there is to how you actually control smooth muscle contraction. It's controlled by those three things on the top right there. And that graph is actually really good in explaining the overall theme of it. So if you want to um, look at that and to understand those, that would probably be really helpful. Okay, this is the last chapter. Um, we went over this a lot. I feel like he went over it pretty well. So we'll go over this quickly, and then I'll take any questions you guys have. But basically what I would memorize and know and focus on is explaining the basic pathways of reflexes. Okay, and describe also the functions of these three things. These are the three biggest things in this chapter. Muscle spindles, a Golgi tendon organ, and crossed extensor reflex. And explain how that works. Okay, so skeletal muscles have these things called proprioceptors in them, and they um, are located in the skeletal muscle itself, the joint capsules, and the ligaments to help you know where exactly your muscles are in space and how much strain you have on those. Okay, so the central nervous system integrates all of this input and releases it onto the somatic motor neurons to elicit certain kinds of responses depending on where your um, muscles are and how much weight they're bearing. And that's done through these things called alpha motor neurons. Okay. Um, yeah, we went over that one a bunch. And the question is yes, or the answer is yes. And that's uh, the basic pathway for that to happen. So the, sensors, the stimulus goes into the um, sensory information, it integrates into the dorsal root ganglion, uh, then goes to the ventral horn, right? So the dorsal root is in the above one, and then the ventral horn goes out to the muscles itself. So that's kind of connecting those two, right? So um, understand that that pathway uh, involves sensory information going into the integration sensor of the spinal cord, which then goes out to the muscles. That's just the grand scheme of things. That's the general understanding. Okay. So the muscle spindle, we went over this, I think, on Monday or today either. It shows how much I pay attention. But anyway, the muscle spindle is inside your muscle fibers themselves. And the muscle spindle is also called uh, intrafusal fibers. Those two are interchangeable. Extrafusal fibers are your conventional muscles, the muscles that we think of, okay? And that integration allows the muscle spindle to sense how much strain these extrafusal fibers have. Since they're right beside each other and since they're connected, the muscle spindle fibers experience the same stimuli as your extrafusal or your conventional muscle fibers do. So they're able to sense information just based on the fact that they experience the same thing, okay? So this is another chronology. Uh, I would be able to um, replicate this. I, these chronology slides are always super important. Um, that's just a general rule of thumb in physiology. But basically, um, the extrafusal muscles are resting, and then um, sensory, like this is, I'm sorry, I should have started with this concept. Spindles are tonically activated all the time. So when you're relaxed and you're just standing there, or you're sitting there, you know you're relaxed because these muscle fibers or these intrafusal muscle spindle fibers are also relaxed. And so you're able to understand that anytime you want to, you can excite them and then um, the proprioception will change. Okay, so it's always active to, under to make sure that you understand that you're relaxed um, and make sure you understand where your limbs are at any given time. And only whenever they change, um, they'll change their firing rate, okay? And that's done through these alpha and gamma coactivations. Um, when the muscle contracts, these alpha motor neuron fires and the gamma neuron fires. Um, and so that stretch on the centers of the intrafusal fibers are unchanged, but the firing rate of the afferent neuron remains constant. And that's how you get that tonic firing um, to let you know that you're relaxed. Okay. So whenever you're not relaxed and you're bearing this massive weight to prevent yourself from hurting yourself or tearing a tendon or tearing your muscles too much. You have these things called uh, Golgi tendon reflexes and they're located uh, around the tendons because that's really what's important. If your muscle tears, it can repair itself really easily and that's actually how you get a lot of muscle growth so that's not a huge deal. But when your tendons tear, the blood supply to your tendons is a lot less than the blood supply to your muscles and so it's a lot harder to repair those and it's a lot more detrimental on your movement because when your tendons tear, then your skeleton system can't, or your skeleton, or your skeleton can't move, 
All right, so these Golgi tendon reflexes are located at the tendons and inhibit muscle contraction whenever a lot of um, weight is um, put onto your muscles. And so when you're trying to deadlift 450 or something, that's why you have to quit. Um, you can't do it anymore. Okay, so this is a pretty good example of how that actually works. So the neurons from the Golgi tendon organ fires. The motor neuron that goes to your muscle is inhibited. That's probably done through GABA or glycine or some kind of um, inhibitory neurotransmitter. Um, relaxes that muscle, you drop the load, and yeah, you prevent yourself from hurting yourself too much. So I would say that's really important. Almost done. Okay, so the patellar, uh, patellar tendon knee jerk reflex, sorry, um, is really cool. It's basically, um, it starts with mechanical mechanoreceptors in your quadricep muscle. Once your tendon stretches, those mechanical receptors are activated, sends an afferent signal to your spinal cord. That afferent signal gets interpreted into inner neurons, which either excite your um, quadricep or inhibit your hamstring. Actually, do both at the same time to cause your um, leg to uh, move. Okay, so definitely know the pathway for that. Um, that'll probably get asked on the test. And then this one's a little bit more complicated. This one is the crossed extensor reflex. And that happens whenever there's painful stimuli on the bottom of your foot. Um, the feet are really important um, for survival because that's how you get around and find food and stuff. So it's pretty intuitive to think that this is a spinal cord mediated response and not a, a brain mediated response. So whenever you feel um, some kind of painful stimuli on your foot, you have that afferent sensory neuron going to the, door, um, to the spinal cord and that um, goes to both sides and inhibits the extensors of one leg while um, exciting the extensors of another leg. And that um, shifts your gravity to the foot that's not stepping on the nail or whatever the case may be and sparing you from uh, further injury. Okay, so that's all I have. That's all we went over for class. Um, so, like I said, chapter 14 is not on the exam. Just all the way up until this point is what's going to be on the exam. Does anyone have any other questions that we want to go over really quick? Anything specific? If you don't want to ask now, that's fine. You can just email me or whatever the case may be. The test closes on Monday, so you have plenty of time. I will um, be in office hours on Friday from two from one to two. But if you want to go over it any time, I'm pretty flexible usually in the afternoons. So just let me know. Thank you. So, Dr. Edwards, I need to send this to you. I think I'm going to do that right now. Okay. Um, I'm just going to make sure I was understanding this. Can you just like, talk about prosopagnosia or like. Yeah, I think that would be fine. Um, Thank you. Just, yeah, no problem. Just try to connect it with your answers. Um, I don't know, if you can make it make sense, if you can justify your reasoning to it, then I'll count it, for sure. Um, so you talk about you know, what I would say, because of this reasoning, and I would have the brain reading to have a little step in that, how it could have been caused. Yeah, I would also add to, um, it's tricky, there's a lot of information in this that leads you in different directions, mm -hmm. and so when we have um, integration of certain stimuli in the brain, it's not oftentimes just um, located at one region because there's so much going on that a lot of time we have different like association regions. So I would definitely go into um, detail about that for sure. Okay. So would it be good to like look up possible different theories influence it together? Yeah. It's like what diagnosis is what you're saying? Yeah, I think so. Okay. I'll look at that. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, so are you going to email that to me for me to grade or? No, I think he wants me to email it to him, to him? but okay. I can just let you know. Okay. Thanks. Question. Yeah. So I've been doing some of the measuring AMP like module uh, dynamic learning themes. Okay. How indicative of it is that? Test. 
due to the test. Okay. Um, did you do the first one um, for exam one? Did you do any of those? Okay. So I, Dr. Edwards is really like specific in how he does his test and what he asks. I don't think he goes into those quizzes very much looking for questions to model his exam about. But any practice you have about physiology where there's a correct answer given to you is going to be helpful. All right. Um, with that, I don't think there will be many questions that are going to be very copy-paste for that. Um, so if you feel like it covers these main questions, right, like these questions before each um, concept, then, yeah, I would definitely um, look at those and try to figure those out, especially if you have spare time. If you don't have much time to study, I would just do these for sure and try to explain much, as much as I can about those. But if you have spare time and you want to look at those quizzes, I would encourage that. I don't think it would hurt you at all. Okay. Sorry, that was kind of a roundabout way of No, yeah, that made sense. Uh, I guess a follow-up question then, are you going to send this out? Yeah, I'm going to email everybody this um, slide, um, these slides, and I'll email everyone the video. Perfect. Well, they Thank you. Yeah, Thank no problem. You. What's up, Ryan? Yeah, real quick. Um, do you think it would be useful to like, kind of memorize like, the effects that certain parts of the unknown nervous system have on different organs? Like, for example, oh, yeah. Like, Okay. Like, oh, yeah. Just like, because he had like very specific ones in the slides, but then he also yeah. had like the one like entry thing. Yeah. Just like the specific ones, like the blood vessels. Oh yeah. Are, okay. For sure. I actually, I feel like I should have put that on the lecture slide. Um, this is. Were you there in class whenever you did that? Yeah. I feel like that slide. Is yeah. Really that slide where he's like, this one increases, yeah. decreases, constricts, dilates, yeah. or like no effect. Right. Okay. That's what I was planning on doing. The, the no was... effect ones are a little bit tricky, so I don't think if. If he's going to ask questions about those, I don't think he'd go into much detail on the no effect ones, mm -hmm. since they are a little bit trickier. But I think for sure he'll ask, like, what does the parasympathetic system do to this or this or this? Or okay, yeah, that makes sense. But I'll just, I'll study that one slide, because that's a little bit more yeah. concise than, like, the big one. Yeah, right. Yeah, for sure. Right. Thanks, man. You got a lot of info done. In, like, yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Have a good one. Yeah, you too, Isaac. See you later. Yep.